Fabulous Fair, Chapter 17, Reunion of a Sort. Lonnie, Megan asked with a strain in her voice as she hauled herself up. Yeah? Just realized something. A deep breath as she reached for the next handhold, then exhaling. I'm a fairy princess. Legally, yeah. Lonnie scrambled ahead of her again. When do I get my gosh darn wings and tiara? If you do, Ashling said quietly, watch out for butterfly collectors. That got things silent for a minute as the two girls dragged themselves onto the grass and got out the snacks from Lonnie's pack. For once, Ashling didn't seem eager to tell a story. In the silence came a sound on the wind. It was a whisper at first, then louder. Megan, can you hear me? Asked the voice like chocolate. Whoa, Lonnie said. I, yeah, Megan muttered. Dad? She immediately wished she had managed to make her first conscious words to her father something a bit more impressive. Good to hear from you, sir. Ashling said. And you as well, Ashling. Lani Kahale counts to 18. Could you excuse the two of us for a few minutes? Of course. And the crow rose into the air and flew a little way farther, Lani following. So you can talk, even though you're frozen or whatever out there. My dear, winter is my time. The ice might be around me, but it's not going to subdue me. It's only because of a terribly clever use of wards and location that I'm stuck at all, and enough effort and preparation can get the occasional communication out. The real salt in the wound is, well, the salt. I'm guessing the salt is another fairy issue I don't know about. Lonnie knows about the Menahune Brownie Strategic Alliance of 1801, I'm still not sure what Seely means. Yes, the voice on the wind replied. But you're managing wonderfully, no doubt. Her dad probably explained a lot of stuff. I'm quite certain he did. Parenting seems to be the sole Menahune job which mustn't be done in one night. Megan sat and thought for a moment, then took a breath. You left when I was two. Yes, two years, two months, two days, and I'll swear on your middle name that it wasn't that you weren't less than delightful," the voice said with a quiet warmth on the cool breeze. I stopped back home for the dance, found out there was a full-blown political crisis, and couldn't foist off the responsibilities anymore. Why didn't you come back? Well, I was very busy, and by the time you were in kindergarten, your mother was very cross. Well, there was no arguing with that. Cross was one of her mom's defining characteristics, along with tired. Megan had seen a lifetime of cross and tired. She remembered Kasha's words, though. There's more to it than that, though, isn't there? There's always more to it, Megan. One realizes one has said just one more day, a few hundred times too many. The wind shifted and she could almost feel a shrug and a smile. So your friends are trying to help? Yeah, mostly because the dance is supposed to be important. Lonnie thinks it's like climate change or something. There was silence in the wind, but not the absent kind of silence. It was the silence of people thinking as they sit next to each other. Then the chocolatey voice spoke. From a passing acquaintance with her father, that seems reasonable. You'd think she'd be allergic to all the science stuff. Isn't that sort of the opposition? Like vampires and churches? A chuckle in the wind. Not at all. Science itself is no particular bane. For that matter, neither are churches. I love science. I love religion. I love how they create wonder and stories and open up minds. I love that they open up the big whys. The only time they're a problem is when people stop wondering, stop grasping for those whys. When the thought that an unseen hand or some invisible set of rules drives things makes people search for answers and meaning, 
or striving to get closer to those things, that's marvelous. It's only when people stop wondering, stop searching, stop researching, or stop caring about the whys, and just have a pat answer of, because science, or because God, before they move on. That's when those things become anathema to fairies. Oh. Megan took a moment to process that. Her dad apparently had a thing for rhetoric, but then, he was in politics, even if it was fairy politics. Suddenly, she asked, Counts to 18? The best translation anyone can manage of the Corvid deed name. It's for his cleverness. Most crows only count to 16. Oh, she paused. We may have left Kasha to be eaten by dogs, Megan confessed. The hounds deserve their legend, but I suspect that's not how her story ends. I've known her for most of her life. I don't recall her being left to be anything for quite some time, so I suspect she had a hand in the matter. It was her idea, yeah. Then all's well, because no matter what your guide and mind says, and this is an important secret, the true distinction of the unseelie is beyond all good, evil, avarice, passion, ambition, jealousy, and so many other things. It's not that, as the seelie value order, we value chaos. It's that any unseelie will always desire at least the option to make the wrong choice. Oh, that actually made sense. Maybe too much sense. So do you know who did this? Know who ambushed me into this trip? I know several of them, but they did not act on their own initiative. Distinctly not idea people. What happens to them when you get out? Megan's mind rushed at all the horrific possibilities having seen what sort of people her father was technically king of. Oh, mostly they'll owe me a favor. That's it? After trapping you and risking the climate shift thing? Just owing you one? There is no just, my dear. While it's not a cold iron wound, owing is one of the worst things that can happen to a fairy. Someone else gets the choice. Promises and debts are as real a thing for us as the breath in your lungs and the color in your eyes. Okay then. So anyway, sounds like you can't really tell us who else might try something. We're trying to get to the Cleve Solish, the Light Sword. The Clive Solish. Yes, that figures, considering where you are. I don't know if I'd be able to find you again without a real energy source against this. The Clive Solish. Well, that's one way of going about it. What were you thinking? Well, Meg and the half-dark whisper was lost on the wind, and there was something about hesitate and step, again with half the words lost. Dad? Dad! Then there was something about losing, dear, and goodbye, and then the air was still. Megan walked in silence to where Lonnie was sitting and recovering. Lonnie opened her mouth, looked at Megan, pulled herself to her feet, and hugged her.